Good afternoon. Um, my name is Ron Perry, and I work here, and um, would like to welcome you all to the Nashville Public Library and another edition of Thinking Out of the Lunchbox with Dr. David Wood. Um, we, as some of you may have noticed, we've changed our, our website around some. If you ever go and visit us, we, we've got a motto: "Books are only half the story." Is is our is our new motto? Some of the staff say that that's the best half. But we do other things, and programs is, is one of the things that we do. And um, what I'd like to do is, is uh, invite you to come to some of our salon at 615 programs are held during the week. And those are authors um, who will come and talk about their books, and you can come and listen, and, and um, they'll sell them afterwards and get them signed. And we make it easy for you to remember that they, it takes, they all take place at 615. They start at 615. It's located here at 615 Church Street. So I uh, hope you'd come for some of those. Um, also, this weekend, we have a uh, Scottish Heritage Festival will be coming up. And that will be running all day. It starts at 10 o'clock. I'm sorry, did you have a question? Or are you just waving? Um, the, we have a Scottish Heritage Festival coming up at 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. It's going to be running all day. There will be bagpipes, kilts, dancing, and, and we're going to have some, some dogs this year. It, it, this is going to be a a new thing for us. They're not the little Scottish Terriers. They're going to have these border collies that are actually working dogs and, and to show how they, they go about doing it. So I'd like to invite you out to that. Um, next weekend we're having um, a Lego contest. And, and for those of you that grew up with Lincoln Logs, it, it might not seem like, like much, but Legos are a big deal these days. They've, they've got a whole store that opened up at Opry Mills this year that's devoted just to Legos. So if you'd like to see what people are doing, creating things, this um, next Saturday, it starts at 1.30. You can come and see those. And then next Sunday, uh, we'll be having a classical guitar concert right here in this, this auditorium. So we hope you'll come and, and take advantage of some of these programs. They're all free and open to the public, so you can come and bring your, your friends and uh, family if you'd like. So uh, without further ado, we'll get on with today's program, and uh, I hope you'll... Um, help. By the way, the, the lunches back there for those that you get, ate, ate lunch. Um, is there a cookie that y'all like better than the other ones? <laughs> I looked through several of those boxes. Those little, were they molasses cookies? Those aren't very good. I didn't like those. <laughs> those black one espresso cookies? Dr. Wood, I don't know if Provence is where they get those, but those I looked through three, three or four different boxes trying to find one. So, anyway, uh, just let Dr. Wood know your preference. Maybe he can let Provence know which cookies to stick in there. And I hope you'll help me in welcoming Dr. Wood for the program. Well, thank you, Ron. I'm going to uh, put that back into the system, the, uh, the cookie request. And if you have any other uh, comments or suggestions that will help us improve things, do, do let me know. As you can tell, we're still uh, fumbling around for a formula uh, as far as the lunch boxes are concerned. And uh, we've got a few left over. If anyone would like to buy another one before they leave, that would be just lovely. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out again on this extraordinary, lovely day. Um, and I want to also acknowledge um, uh, uh, Alan, Alan Berry, uh, a friend of mine and a friend of the philosophy department who's helping uh, sponsor this, uh, this series. Uh, Alan's here, and he's going to see if he likes the program or not. <laughs> now, um, today we have a, another wonderful uh, speaker, um, Mike Newton who is uh, my colleague at Vanderbilt, a professor of law, professor of the, the practice of law, and director of our Vanderbilt in Venice program that focuses on international law and comparative law. Now, I've asked Mike to address us today because this spring is the 10th anniversary of the opening of Guantanamo Bay Detention Camp and Interrogation Center in Cuba. And I have to say, this is not an anniversary that many people will celebrate. Uh, as you may remember, Obama promised to close Guantanamo and has been unable to do so. Its very existence 
for many, remains a challenge to basic principles of justice and a blight on America's reputation in the world. And yet, there are genuinely conflicting principles at play. It may be said that a nation has the right to do anything to protect its citizens against harm. And Guantanamo undoubtedly harbors some people who wish us harm. On the other hand, it's been the site of torture and an arguably shameful attempt to avoid our obligations under the Geneva Convention and international law more generally. And this, perhaps, endangers America even more. As a terrorist recruitment poster, it would be hard to improve on that image of Lindy England taunting her prisoner on a dog leash. So Guantanamo presents us with a heady brew of legal, ethical, political, and more broadly prudential questions. And I don't know of anyone in a better position to address these in a balanced way than Mike Newton. Mike is a graduate of the University of Virginia, the Judge Advocate General School, and the United States Military Academy at West Point. He's an expert in international humanitarian law, international criminal law, special tribunals, terrorism and counterterrorism, and national security law. And he has an extraordinary record of publication and honors and service around the world. Professor Newton's a member of the International Institute of Humanitarian Law and the International Bar Association at Vanderbilt. He developed um, and teaches the innovative International Law Practice Lab and develops educational opportunities for students interested in international legal issues. He serves on the Executive Council of the American Society of International Law, and he's previously served on its task force on US policy toward the International Criminal Court and on an experts group in support of the task force on genocide prevention established by the US Holocaust Memorial Museum and the US Institute of Peace. His students worked in support of the Public International Law Policy Group to advise the governments of Afghanistan, Kosovo, Sri Lanka, Kenya, Uganda, and other countries. And he negotiated the Elements of Crime document for the International Criminal Court. As the senior advisor to the ambassador at large for war crimes issues in the US State Department, Mike Newton implemented a wide range of policy positions related to the law of armed conflict. This list of extraordinary achievements goes on and on. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I just skip a few. <laughs> it's terribly impressive. Oh, well, I, OK, I, I won't skip them. Sorry. Um, <laughs> he began his distinguished military career as an officer in the 4th Battalion, 68th Armored Division, Fort Carson, Colorado. Later. As an operational military attorney, he served with the US Army Special Forces Command at Fort Bragg in North Carolina in support of units participating in Desert Storm. Following duty as the Chief of Operational Law, he served as the Group Judge Advocate for the 7th Special Forces Group. And he deployed on Operation Provide Comfort to assist Kurdish civilians in northern Iraq as well as a number of other exercises and operations. From 93 to 95, he was assigned as the Brigade, Brigade Judge Advocate for the 194th Armored Brigade, during which time he organized and led the human rights and rules of engagement education for all multinational forces and international police deployed into Haiti. To keep himself busy, um, Mike Newton also writes articles and books, about 70. And if you've seen law, law professors' articles, they are like books. As well as opinion pieces for the New York Times, International Herald Tri Tribune, and other papers. He's the author of a book from, uh, I guess, what certainly was the winner in 2009 of the Book of the Year Award of the International Association of Penal Law, and it's called Enemy of the State, the Trial and Execution of Saddam Hussein. And he currently serves as senior editor of the Terrorism International Case Law Reporter series published annually by the Oxford University Press. 
And you can hear and see Mike Newton on CNN, on BBC, NPR, and other media outlets. Well, you can see why it is with enormous pleasure that I welcome Professor Mike Newton to talk to us today. Mike. <laughs> Y'all are kind to applaud before you've even heard a single word. I'm impressed. I, I might as well quit while I'm ahead. Um, in some sense, I want to change my bio online just to say a decent guy and a good dad, or at least a dad that tries hard. Um, I saw somebody the other day doing an interview on the street in a big fuzzy blue CNN microphone, and they you know, stick it in the guy's face, and they say, what do you think is the biggest problem in America today? Is it ignorance? Or is it apathy? And the dude looked back at him and he said, I don't know and I don't care. Just leave me alone. <laughs> I was like, touche. No, it, it really is special that you all take time out of your, out of your schedules. You all have all got things to do to stay engaged, to stay intellectually active. And I have a very, very modest objective today um, to, to, to give some perspective on Guantanamo and then to try to sort of, on a, in a more fine-grained way, give you some of the legal advice, um, some of the legal perspective that you don't ever hear in the media. Um, and in, in a very succinct, kind of a clean, easy way, explain for you some of the misconceptions and some of the conceptions that are proper in terms of what you really need to know about the place. Um, my, my primary goal is to spend lots of time talking. We want to have a dialogue, and we want to have your questions, lots of that. So I really want to talk at most, maybe 15, 17 minutes, and if, we, if, I, if I go longer than that, you can get up and leave. Um, there's plenty to be said in terms of questions. Uh, the, the main thing about Guantanamo, and in, in the interest of full disclosure, I'll tell you that uh, at the time I was serving in the Office of War Crimes uh, in the State Department, working for, at that time, Secretary Powell, uh, I actually received the phone call Christmas Eve of 2001 and said, you're going to leave tomorrow morning. I said, I don't want to leave tomorrow morning. How about the next morning? And it's fine. So the day after Christmas, 2001, um, had an e-ticket in the system. They flew me to Camp Lejeune. And that was the task force that very quickly put together what became Guantanamo Bay. Um, and if you've ever seen, you, you see the recurring picture on CNN. Some of you, and you show me hands. Have you seen the picture of Guantanamo Bay with the guy in the orange jumpsuit and the dog wire and the chain link fences and all? You've seen that picture? There's a reason why all they had time to do was to put up some chain link fence because nine days later, detainees began to show up. How many people have seen the picture lately of what the place looks like today? Anybody seen it? State of the art federal penitentiary, million dollar penitentiary. In fact, I have a slide. If you really want me to bore you with PowerPoint slides, I'll send you a 50 slide presentation if you'd like. I've got one. Um, one of my slides is to say, here's a picture of a, of a congressman from Illinois who was convicted of corruption. Here's his cell. Here's the cell of, of a Guantanamo detainee. Guess what? Same contractor, same design, identical same cell. So if you have this mental picture of Guantanamo as this place of you know, chain link fences and kind of dog runs and you know, guys standing outside with water hoses moving people, well, that's just a false conception in terms of the way the place is currently structured and currently run. Um, so really, my, my objectives, oh, and then, and then the other thing I wanted to say to you, which I said before, in the interest of full disclosure, uh, you should know that I actually wrote the presidential decision memo um, that laid out the various options for a detention facility, and one of those options was Guantanamo Bay, as opposed to other classified options. So I can't get into the other classified pieces of that. Anything you want to know about Guantanamo, how it was set up, how it was run, et cetera, I'm happy to talk about on an unclassified level. So really, I just have three, three goals. One is to talk about rationale, uh, well, I'm sorry, reasons, the reasons why this came into being. Two, the rationale. And three, if you'll allow me to get on my soapbox, I say this all the time with my students. A student will ask a question and say, I'm going to get on my soapbox. And I said that in class one time, and from the back of this theater seating comes a pizza box. And they had, they had taken it, and they had taped it, and it said, Newton's soapbox. So before I sit down to answer questions, I'm going to get on my soapbox a little bit and tell you, in my personal opinion, having, having seen Guantanamo from the inside and the outside and dealt with it overseas, what the real key issues are, uh, at least a couple of them, and as I see them, and I will take questions. First off, the title of this talk today, Terrorists Are People Too. 
Who believes that? Yeah, but you're shockingly radical, right? Um, radical statement actually on two levels. One, very controversial in European circles, that we would call somebody a terrorist. In European circles, um, partly because of the Human Rights School, partly because of the UN Human Rights Council, all my friends in Geneva say, Mike, you're just too mean. Don't call them terrorists. Call them people suspected or alleged of having committed terrorist acts at some point in their life, directly or indirectly. What's that sound like? Terrorist, right? But, but there's a critical point there, which I think relates to the moral debate, which is this sense of prejudgment, this sense of pre-punishment. Because we label somebody a terrorist, a terrorist, quote unquote, there's a pejorative element to that that says they don't belong to society, they're different. Somehow they're not human, they're subhuman. Um, and I, don't, I certainly don't subscribe to that rule. For me, terrorist is a descriptive term. Here's a person who has committed terrorist acts or where there's good prima facie indications of a terrorist act. So be careful the way you use that term because, as my wife is fond of saying to me, people will import meaning into the words that you use whether you want them to or not. Um, when you say terrorist, you'll find many, many people who will import into that that you're prejudging in a pejorative way, uh, in, a, in a way sort of demeaning them as less than human. Terrorists really are people too. And that leads to the second point, which is this very complicated, very complicated, and I can explain it to you in, in, in some brief, succinct ways if you'd like, this very complicated, extraordinarily difficult, but I would say extraordinarily important interface between really the trifecta of issues. There's human rights law, to the extent that it does or doesn't apply, and the normative contents of that, we can talk about that. In the context of an armed conflict, you're familiar, I'm sure, with the laws and customs of war. How does that apply? What is the normative bounds of the law? More importantly, how do those two things fit together? I want you to get the image of, um, in this part of the country, maybe, maybe uh, earthquake fissures or, or icebergs. These two huge bodies of law that bump up against each other, and when they bump up against each other, it's messy. Anybody ever stood on the edge of a glacier? as it's retreating, it's messy, isn't it? And so, gee, are we shocked that in Guantanamo and in other places where these two bodies of law bump up, there's debris and there's uncertainty and there's pieces chunked off from each of those opposing forces. And then the third piece that makes it even more complicated, you know, I'm a lawyer, I think like a lawyer, I write like a lawyer, I talk to lawyers, I'm fairly comfortable in that channel, is the larger moral public dimensions of it. To the extent that you take these kinds of core activities and you divorce them from the morality, from the sheer humanity of these issues, you do them a serious disservice. And so all these, these factors comp swirl around. And I will tell you, the morning of September the 12th, we walked into the Deputy Secretary of State's office, who's my boss, big old gruff Marine, cigar smoking, you know, although he doesn't in the State Department, big old weightlifter, great guy wonderful human being. And we said, hey boss, what are you going to do with the ones that you capture alive? Typical Marine answer, there won't be any alive, get out of my office. <laughs> okay. Okay. Not a problem, go do something important. Okay. And then of course that afternoon they called us back in They said, y'all need to start thinking about this. It's problematic because it's not easy and you can't put it on a three by five card. Um, so there's your ration, the, 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 the reasoning is that you have to have, you simply have to have a place like Guantanamo Bay or something like it. There's a pragmatic necessity. So, you know, we focus on the president's election rhetoric that says, I'm going to shut it down and I'm going to issue an executive order. And I'm sitting back watching and what have you seen? The pragmatic necessity of governing says, if I shut it down, obviously, it raises a whole host of collateral questions, each of which in its own way is incredibly complicated. Why create even one of those collateral difficulties when I've got a single forum that solves all of those things, not in the optimal way. It's a suboptimal solution, mind you, but it does solve all of these conflicting things without the, necess the necessity. And that's what I would say about Guantanamo. It's a pragmatic necessity. And if you really want to know why, I can explain that. Second thing is the rationale. Uh, and this is a sort of, a, I'll digress for just a few minutes and give you just a, just a sense of how these issues fit together. In the laws and customs of war, as you all know, I'm sure, 
um, it's a completely different rubric. The reason you detain people and just the conceptual baseline is that I detain people because they're hostile, they're a threat to me, and I detain them until the cessation of hostilities for two reasons. One, to protect myself and my soldiers, my personnel. Well, that's the obvious one. The second one is perhaps even more important, which is to facilitate their reintegration back into civilian society at the cessation of hostilities. The entire body of detention authorities in the laws and customs of war is built on the fundamental underlying premise that we're in a temporary, temporary state of hostilities. The norm is peace. There's all my normal huge body of law and practice relative to peacetime. The aberration then is armed conflict. And what I'm doing is creating the conditions. And I could tell you some wonderful, wonderful stories of, for example, Americans who were in German prisoner of war camps in World War II. There's a great classic story from Texas. Years later, German camp guard is in this federal judge's court who happened to have been in a prisoner of war and knew the guy, and it all worked out. And the point is, very simply put, that in the laws and customs of war, you very clearly have the legal authority to detain people until the cessation of hostilities. The rules are very clear. There's a whole convention on it, and it's very complicated. And I will tell you, all of that body of law does not apply to that situation. It simply doesn't. And so pejoratively, you hear lots and lots and lots of rhetoric that Guantanamo was chosen as a way of bypassing the United States legal obligations. We wanted to spit in the eye of the Geneva Conventions. And you know, the White House counsel runs around saying they're quaint. They're obsolete. True in some ways. But from that, you would be mistaken to derive do you really think that Mike Newton would advise the Secretary of State, just ignore the Geneva Conventions? Dah, they're quaint, they're stupid, they're dumb, they're obsolete. No, and I'll tell you why. Because ignoring our obligations under the body of law directly endangers American lives and American forces, and more importantly, undermines our moral authority. The essence of command is for commanders at every level you know, you referenced uh, Lindy England at Abu Ghraib. Who's responsible for Abu Ghraib? I would submit to you that it's not Don Rumsfeld sitting in his office in the E-ring. There's a platoon leader, there's a platoon sergeant, there's a low line level of leadership whose job it is to know what's going on at 2 o'clock in the morning on the night watch at Abu Ghraib. And the point is that our moral and legal obligation flows through command channels from the top all the way down to the very bottom to the extent that we for even one moment say all oh, that Geneva Convention stuff it's obsolete it's irrelevant it's not important what we do is we weaken discipline we weaken professionalism and we critically undermine our efforts so then the question is well why didn't they get prisoner of war status answer they didn't they weren't entitled to it legally simply put and I can explain why if you're interested. Uh, anybody interested in that kind of legal detail? I, I talk like a law professor, I know. I mean, two, very, two very simple prongs. All right, so show of hands. How many folks want me to explain this? All right, two very, very simple prongs. In the traditional laws and customs of war, which apply to international armed conflicts, you've heard of the, the status of prisoners of war, right? You've heard of the status of combatants. The, t the concept of combatancy is exclusively related to an international armed conflict. It is, if you ever say combatant, as the Bush administration so idiotically did, are we being taped here? Are we, are you gonna Twitter me? How many of y'all use Twitter? Don't Twitter me. Um, but this whole phrase that came out of the White House Counsel's Office and the D Department of Justice, unlawful combatants, is just idiotic. It's wrong. It's a complete oxymoron. Why? Because there is no such thing as combatancy in a non-international armed conflict, which is what we're in with Al-Qaeda, or a transnational armed conflict, if you want to think of it this way, against a non-state actor. It's just, it's, it's a legal impossibility for two reasons. One, because when you say somebody's a combatant, they have the right to use force. They have the right to kill somebody, and we give people medals for that. We don't call them criminals. We don't prosecute them. It's called combatant immunity. The converse side of that, though, is that they may be targeted just based on their status. When you are a combatant, you may be targeted. When you are home on leave, when you are standing in the chow line with your tray, you may be targeted. When you are asleep, you may be targeted. Why? Because of your status as a combatant. That is not true 
in the kind of conflict with which we find ourselves with Al-Qaeda. It's an oxymoron. So when you import that into Guantanamo, everybody, every combatant, no matter who they are, if you are a combatant in an international armed conflict and you are captured in that instant, you become a protected person. That's the legal description. You become a protected person and you are a prisoner of war, period. Very straightforward, very simple. So you see the first reason why um, uh, Al-Qaeda detainees at Guantanamo aren't prisoners of war. A, it's not an international armed conflict in that same legal sense. And B, they weren't combatants to start with. Therefore, to automatically accord them prisoner of war status, it, it just doesn't equate. Okay? And there's lots of technical arguments you can get into. There's a provision, Article 4 of the Third Geneva Convention, if you're interested, I can send it to you, which talks about militias and, and members of forces that are affiliated with um, a, a state or state actors. Uh, so, and I, and I will tell you this, and this may sound self-serving, I don't mean it to be self-serving. We had huge fights about this, and if any of you think that the Bush administration listened to the, the White House counsel and just said, well, those Geneva Conventions, they're archaic, they're obsolete, they're quaint, they're cute, but, and they're historical relics. Um, I will tell you no. We did very hard, good faith lawyering, and the Geneva Conventions just don't apply to those people. Okay, Al Qaeda detainees, not prisoners of war. Um, Taliban, a slightly closer question. You have to presume that the Taliban were in fact the legitimate armed forces of the state of Afghanistan. That's the legal leap that you have to make. Now, how many folks believe that? Did you watch the aftermath of the military invasion? As soon as we flipped the warlord, what happened to his big chunk of Taliban forces? They disappeared. Why? Who are they loyal to? What's your name? Yabrina. What a cool name. So who are they loyal to? The warlord, exactly. Ergo ipso facto, talking like a lawyer. Got to use some Latin. By definition, they're not the armed forces of Afghanistan. They're the cobbled together armed forces loyal to a group of warlords who may or may not, depending on the, the benefits and the entitlements, be loyal to the state of Afghanistan. But even then, they're not loyal to Af They're not the Afghan army in that sense. They're a cobbled together ragtag group of military, quasi-military forces loyal to a group of warlords. You see? Therefore, it follows that they don't automatically get combatant status and prisoner of war status the second they're captured. See? Does that make sense? It's called winning. <laughs> it's called pragmatism. But, but in fact, when, and, and that's a good question, because when you flipped it around, if the Taliban recaptured one of those people, you think they would have treated them as a prisoner of war? Not by the hair of your chinny chin chin. They just didn't get that legal status. That's the point. Okay? And the key thing I just want you to understand is that there was never this deliberate attempt to just sub, uh, uh, submerge the Geneva Conventions or torpedo the Geneva Conventions. They're really, and that issue was really good faith lawyering and it just doesn't fit. Which then leads to the second and I think the more important premise. So if that body of law doesn't apply, then what does apply? Terrorists really are people too. And the argument is, human rights law fully applies. And I argued that in the halls of the Pentagon, in the halls of the Justice Department, and we lost that argument. Because the presumption was to say, if you fully apply human rights law, and there's some technical legal reasons why it might not fully apply, but there really was this assumption in parts of our government that said, well, they're terrorists. They don't get any rights. They're terrorists. And to say that the Geneva Conventions don't apply is a very far leap from saying that they have no rights, that there are no legal obligations. They're very different statements. And yet there were many people in policy channels that made that leap of logic to say the only things they're entitled to is what we in our, in our munif munificence choose to give to them. And, and there, there was a hard core of us saying, no, 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 all contraire. There's a hard kernel of rights and privileges that these people get simply by virtue of their humanity. Okay? And again, just to be clear, human rights law as a distinct body of law may or may not apply, and there's pieces of it that are relevant, but again, that's a very different statement from saying that these people have no rights. Among them, common Article Three of the Geneva Conventions, which is the right to all the things that you would expect, the right to humane treatment, 
the right to personal dignity, the right not to be tortured, the right to have full and fair criminal trial proceedings. And we can talk about the military commissions if y'all are interested. I know a lot about them, and we're still working on those trials. Those are all fundamental rights that you would say, what has become of the United States of America where we have a kangaroo court and we just do like Joseph Stalin would have, did, would have done, and we have a Stalinist court and we say, you're guilty. Saddam Hussein. I, I would be remiss if I didn't plug my book. My wife says, don't talk about your book, but I will. <laughs> Uh, if you really want to know what's behind the scenes of, of the Saddam trial, I put the Saddam trial and Guantanamo in exactly the same conceptual category in the sense that there's a solidified public opinion out there which in many ways is not related to the facts of what happened. That's why we wrote the book about the Saddam trial. It's the inside, really the inside view of what really happened. Everything from what's going on in the chambers with the judges, I was there, I was advising them, to what happened at the execution that you never saw on TV that nobody ever explained. That's why you write the book. Um, for classified confidential reasons, people can't write the same book about Guantanamo. And even if they did, you wouldn't believe it. All right? You'd say, well, that's just sort of the, 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 the popular story. Um, so go out. if you're interested in the, Guant the Saddam trial, enemy of the state, the trial and execution of Saddam. Um, back to Guantanamo. The idea that, that this is what Saddam used to do. Saddam, if you look, there's a picture in the book. This is the reason I started this, this line of logic. Uh, of Right next to him, literally, the beady-eyed face of evil is the chief judge of the Saddam Revolutionary Courts. Saddam did exactly the same thing the Nazis did. He had a parallel court system, called it the Revolutionary Courts. And if Saddam didn't like you, he sent you to the Revolutionary Courts. The person on trial next to him for the crime against humanity of murder, but these are court proceedings, and there's, you know, it's the judge, the presiding judge of those Revolutionary Courts. They killed over 10,000 Iraqis. They would just walk in and say, you and you and you, you're a jury. We're going to convict him. Got any questions? You got any questions? Good, get to it, and we better be out of here in 15 minutes because we got, we got to vacate the room. Any problems? Get to it, and I want an execution about 3 o'clock. That's the way Saddam's trial worked. You, you like that? Well, tough. You should have thought about that before you defied the regime. right? So for the United States to take that same judicial approach and implement it in the context of Guantanamo would have been an absolute aberration an absolute abomination of everything that America stands for. And yet, I will tell you, that's the perception overseas, is that the United States just said, bah. They're terrorists, right? They don't get fair rights. They don't try. They don't have rights. They don't get fair trial. They don't get anything wrong, OK? And again, it, there's some conceptual, um, why don't they get lawyers the day they come in? Answer, because they're detained under the laws and customs of war. They're not charged with anything. You get a criminal lawyer when you're charged with something. Right? Um, et cetera, et cetera. There were a number of really complex questions related to, OK, we know that Geneva Conventions don't apply. We know that some combination of human rights principles do apply. And we know, uh, and this is all at the NSC level, the National Security Council level. Um, but we also know that we have a long-term problem here. We want to run it well, and we want to look like the good guys. So what do we do with this brand new set of problems? All right, so let me give you some hypotheticals, and then I'll get on my soapbox, and then we'll take questions. Um, question, do you allow them to receive mail or not? Geneva Conventions, if they were prisoners of war, they had the absolute right to receive mail. Who wants to let them get mail? Ooh, man, y'all are tough. Tough crap. Who wants to let them get mail? Raise them high. Who doesn't want to let them get mail? Raise them high. Oh, wow, y'all are a tough crowd. We decided to let them get mail. Um, of course, you're going to censor it. And I'll tell you why, and this is true. Don't Twitter this. It was, it's not classified, but it's not public knowledge. Um, in the early days of Guantanamo, in the first 90 days, we had, in, in the Al-Qaeda training manual, there's a whole uh, protocol for what to do if you're captured. And one of them, of course, is a whole false, sto false identity, false story, false all of these, this protocol. And I will honestly tell you, the only way we actually ever got an accurate roster of who we had was when we started letting them get mail. <laughs> Walked in one day and he said, OK, Habib from Peshawar, Pakistan. Give me a minute. Well, I'm not really Habib. And I'm really not from Peshawar. 
you know, I'd like to get mail from my family, so let me give you my real name and my real address. It was quite a useful, pragmatic thing. It's the only way we ever got an accurate. Um, the Geneva Conventions say uh, that you're allowed to organize. Anybody watch Hogan's Heroes? <laughs> Remember Hogan's Hero? He's the senior ranking officer and he organizes. Okay, how many folks want to let them organize down there? Have a senior ranking officer, kind of a union rep if you want to think of it that way, that represents detainees and prisoners vis-a-vis -vis the camp authority. And, you know, you have your meetings and you plan and you go, who wants to allow, allow that? Oh, y'all are so nice. No way. No way are we going to allow a group of hardened terrorists to get together, in fact, to, f to falsify their criminal trial testimony, right? To, to, to plot. Um, one of our allies, I can't tell you which one because this is classified, one of the Western detainees, and you would think, nice guy, white skin, nice guy, just happened to be in the wrong place, wrong time. When he went into Guantanamo, spit on a guard and said, before I leave here, I will kill an American. There's no way I'm going to allow him to meet with all his buddies and figure out how to do that. Okay, so they don't get the right to organize. How many of y'all went to summer camp when you were kids? You love summer camp, right? Um, you should have had in summer camp a little, your mom would give you like 10 bucks. Maybe if you were rich, you got 15. And you can use it to buy Cokes and candy and Cracker Jacks and things like that. How many folks had that experience? The Geneva Conventions say that you get what's it's called a canteen in the conventions. How many folks want to give them that? Yeah, y'all are so nice. We actually did that, not for the reason that you would imagine. It's not legally required, but it's a great incentive system. If you're behaving and you're not, you're not spitting on guards and not defecating on guards and throwing defecation at guards, you get to use the canteen. And there was no money exchanged. But you get to go there once a month, twice a month, once a week. There's an incentive system, and it works very well to help monitor conduct. Works very well. Um, and then my last one. How many folks want to let in the International Committee of the Red Cross? After all those annoying pests from, from Geneva, and that's all they do is cause problems and you know go out and stir the pot. How many folks will let in the ICRC? Absolutely. We let in the ICRC to Guantanamo from day one. That's not in the New York Times. You won't see that. But the ICRC was there from day one. Why? Because it's the right thing to do. Now, there's tons of mistakes made in the context of Guantanamo that I'm happy to answer questions about. I mean, my simple point is that it wasn't this reckless, they're all terrorists, therefore we will treat them like subhuman animals from day one. Lots of mistakes made, and I can tell you why those mistakes were made and who I think is responsible for many of those mistakes. But it was not this reckless. And the other thing is, nobody ever anticipated in those early days that, that we'd be a decade later now, not one inch closer to closing, closing Guantanamo than we were a decade ago. We have managed successfully to transfer, some of you may have seen the statistics, we've transferred about four times as many people as are currently in custody to other countries and other contexts. The biggest problem at Guantanamo today is how to transfer the people that can be transferred, who wants to accept them, what are the terms and conditions of which country, what are the monitoring protocols. Uh, right now the recidivism rate is about 30%. So how do, you, how do you prevent that? How do you control that? Do you, do you implant like a GPS monitor in somebody's ankle? You can't do that. Human rights law didn't allow you to do that, but it sure would be nice, right? If you, if you knew this particular person was back in an Al-Qaeda tra training cell in Yemen, I'd love to be able to punch a screen and have them come up. But we can't do that under human rights law. So there's this whole, whole very complex layer of second and third order problems. You have a core of about 50 people who really are true world-class dangers. And it's very difficult to have an easy, pragmatic solution for what to do with that group of about 40 or 50, which leads me to my last soapbox point, and then we'll talk, and I'll answer your questions. Um, the problem with Guantanamo, in my view, was that we, almost from day one, almost from moment one, were hypocritical. We did not follow what our law and what our policy says. For example, um, because these are novel legal questions, they're at this very complicated confluence of law and policy and morality and philosoph philosophical interests and human rights and law of armed conflict, very complicated questions. 
our guidance in the DOD directives and the JCS directives, we're not going to make, anybody ever been in the military? What rank? Good, good, perfect, see, perfect example, perfect choice of seats. We are not going to make the E4 carry around the law books that I have or my bookshelf. You're not the expert, I am. What we say to the E4 or the Marine gunnery tech, we say, quote, and I'm quoting it to you, follow the laws and customs of war at all times in all conflicts and treat people with human dignity no matter how they are characterized. In other words, for the E4, for the Marine in Fallujah, don't do this whole technical legal distinction. You got a rule of engagement card, you know what the law says, just do what's right. Now, by example, what that means is when the first people come into Guantanamo Bay, the Geneva Convention says they get an Article 5 hearing, a little hearing to figure out who they are and what they're all about and do we have the legal right to even detain them. The Bush administration decided not to do that and from that moment on, the perceptions of Guantanamo were fatally flawed. Had we done that, we would have been able to say, hey, the law doesn't fit, but we're the good guys. We follow the laws and customs of war and the spirit and principles of the law, that's what the policy says, at all times, even when it doesn't fit. And look at these subhuman terrorist groups that behead people, that hold no trials, that intentionally murder and slaughter civilians. We want to fight on the side of civilization. And we said all that with our rhetoric but our actions didn't meet that same standard. And this is my soapbox. In a counterinsurgency like the one that we're in, in a complex transnational conflict against non-state actors, your moral credibility is everything. It is everything. If you're in Afghanistan today, and the Taliban comes in on one hand and says, if you don't do what we say, we're gonna slaughter your family, and burn your house down, which they have no compunction about doing, the Americans or the NATO allies come in on the other hand and say, hey, we're the good guys, help us. You have a very difficult choice to make. And I will tell you that I could give you hundreds of examples of both Iraqis and Afghans that have chosen to do the right thing on the basis of principle. To the extent in Guantanamo that we were not operating in fidelity to our own principles, we let all those people down. And I would say we let the American people down and very directly undermined what we're trying to accomplish. And that's a problem. Just for, just for the E4s out there, we put those E4s in greater danger than they needed to be otherwise. We, we dramatically complicated our efforts to have allies who cooperate with us. Here, we've got this young guy, we captured him, we don't want him, we know he's not a threat, we want to ship him home to, name your country, France, Germany, Australia, uh, Yemen, Estonia, Slovenia, Belgium, wherever. We dramatically complicate those efforts. And then most importantly, for my purposes as a criminal trial lawyer, we incredibly complicate the effort to come in and have a clean criminal trial where I can then properly label you as a terrorist. Why? because I have proven that you did this beyond a reasonable doubt, I have admissible evidence, and I, I make that harder. And for me, that's just dumb. That just was unwise. Okay. Yes? Open, uh, open it to the floor. I, I think, I, I mean, I really uh, enormously respect the both sides of this issue that you presented here. I think, um, you know, before I heard you talk, I had the following sort of problems about Guantanamo. One was it wasn't at all obvious that, that the wars that we were engaged with in, in Afghanistan and Iraq were legal in the first place. Mm -hmm. So the question of, you know, whether we're doing the right thing in Guantanamo is, in a sense, requires you to accept that we were in the right place in Afghanistan or right. Iraq in the first place. And I, I actually still don't believe that's true. Second, uh, an awful lot of people, it, as I understand it, were picked up or handed in for bounties mm -hmm. uh, who shouldn't have been handed in at all. So the, the, your first right. point about whether these people should be called terrorists is, is, is a really good one right. because a lot of these people were just victims of you know, local feuds and, and, and bounty hunters. Mm -hmm. And the third, there are four of these, I mean, the third one is that I, as I see it, and this may, be a, a come, come, may come under your reference to um, uh, 
human rights law is that the fundamental principle in the law, as I understand it, uh, way back from you know, English law, is habeas corpus, mm -hmm. which means, as I understand it, the right to uh, some sort of a, a hearing uh, once you've been captured. Pretty soon, I mean, not, not you know, 10 years later, but pretty soon after you've been captured, you, you know, present the body you know, and right. justify that you've got this person. And that seems to have been uh, set aside or distorted in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. And the very last thing is, you didn't mention this, but as I understand it, you know, we practiced some serious kinds of torture mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in the shape of waterboarding. And this goes to your point about our reputation and our image. And this is not just distortion, that, you know, misunderstanding. This yeah. seems to have been admitted. And that is the most terrible uh, uh, ad advertisement for all our values, mm -hmm. and so I'm. Uh, yeah, you'll you be happy to know I can address all of those in less than a minute. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, on the point about the legality of conflicts, the simple answer is it doesn't matter, irrespective of debates about Afghanistan. Afghanistan, as a matter of international law, no problem with with Afghanistan. Much more conceptually difficult. Uh, when we're see picking up al-Qaeda terrorists in Bosnia and Herzegovina or bringing them from the jungles of Indonesia or the, the plains of Yemen, much more difficult. Um, but, but they're dichotomous bodies of law. Uh, our obligations under the Geneva Conventions and the laws and customs of war have no bearing whatsoever to the legality of the conflict. It's a standard. Uh, to, say, to say it backwards, are all Germans war criminals because they committed aggression going into Poland? Of course not. The legal standards in the conflict are applicable irrespective. Second one, um, absolutely. There were many, many people, although not as many, you know, the, 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 the public right. mythology about, about al-Qaeda is that most of the people that were at Guantanamo, they, you typically hear I was a missionary, um, I was a bread seller, I was a tourist, I was, those are all cover stories for the most part. The real problem is bounties. Many of those people were in fact clan feuds or bounties, or let's just say I like your property. I want to get you out of your house because I don't. you're my neighbor and I hate your guts. Boom, I turn you in and I get your house. Pretty nifty plan. If I can get the Americans to take you away and then ship you to some third country, I'm the winner. And that's why it's critically important. We made a fatal mistake, in my view, not to do that sorting mechanism the minute they came in. And that's different than habeas. Habeas is um, the, the legal hearing that was ultimately required by the Supreme Court for Guantanamo to say uh, that you have a legal right to hold me and then send me to trial. When the detention authority comes from the laws and customs of war, nobody in world history has ever done habeas, ever, until now, after the Supreme Court ordered them to do it. That's, that's a whole new development. Um, and so, no, they're not entitled to habeas, except that now they're entitled to habeas because the Supreme Court said so, right. because Guantanamo is a sui generis situation. Um, and with respect to torture, the, the vast bulk of things technically are not torture. It's this much broader amorphous category called cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment, which we built into the Torture Convention, and make no mistake about it, those are war crimes. Um, I think to the extent that we didn't treat them with the severity that they deserved, um, we, we perpetrated criminal conduct. And that's why in the early days you saw lots of the military resigning in protest. You saw military prosecutors resigning. You saw um, Army JAGs resigning their commissions or, or uh, requesting reassignment because they, they didn't want to be facilitated in that. And for some commander to order them to do that is in itself a war crime. It goes and, back to Nuremberg. Exactly. And that's why those practices very quickly gravitated out of military channels into non-military channels. Okay, so we're going to open this. Thank you. We're going to open this to the, the audience. Um, we'll start off with that lady there, and we'll come down to you. Yes. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That was fascinating. I, I have two questions. The, the microphone's coming around the back here. I can, I can be louder. I can hear you. Is there a legal definition of terrorism in international law now? Yeah. Who, who is a terrorist? And uh, the other question, maybe I just missed something, but if these people in Guantanamo are not enemy combatants and not prisoners of war, why are they tried in military tribunals? 
Oh, Why is this not a, 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 a criminal? Right, let me do the situation. second one, actually, first easy, because classically, um, when you were detained under military authority and you were in what's the technical term is unprivileged belligerent, unlawful belligerent, just stay away from the word combatant. The bottom line is you have no right to participate. Article 75 of Protocol 1, if you're interested in the homework assignment, look it up. It says, persons who do not benefit from more favorable treatment under the other provisions of applicable law, meaning you're not a combatant, you're not a prisoner of war, you're not a protected person, you're not a civilian, all these other, you're not a civilian attorney, all these other specifically designated protected categories, Article 75 of Protocol 1 gives you the catch-all provisions and it's essential due process clauses. It's what we think of as fundamental due process. Answer, historically, everybody who fits those criteria have been tried in military commissions. No question. They're civilians in name only, in the sense that they're, they're, they're participants in conflict. So the technical term is civilian taking direct part in hostilities. They're, they're a civilian, but they're a special kind of civilian. They're an unlawful protected, uh, unprotected civilian is the way to say it. Um, and so historically, in a long line of precedence, those kind of people have been prosecuted in uh, military tribunals, uh, military commissions. Lots and lots and lots of examples. Um, in fact, again, we're in a new place in Guantanamo where people have committed crimes applicable, where in fact there's even a choice that they could be prosecuted in civilian court or military commissions. We've never ever had that situation before until now, um, which raises a whole host of questions about evidentiary sufficiency and why not just try them all in military or civilian courts. And I answer very simply and pragmatically, why do you need to go there? You don't need to go there. There's plenty of legal authority to do people in military commissions when it's appropriate. Similarly, concurrently, there's plenty of legal authority to do them in regular civilian courts when it's appropriate, which gets to your second. No, there's no overarching um, comprehensive terrorism convention in, in the world today. We've, fought, we've wrestled with this problem for the last 60 years. Remember, World War I was started by a terrorist act, okay? Um, and so rather than having uh, uh, these, these debates, if you want, I, just, I did a law review piece on this in the Texas Journal of International Law, if you want to read it, on this exact debate. Um, rather than doing that, what we've done is we have a whole range, there are 34 sectoral conventions. In other words, we prosecuted the acts of terrorism. So hijacking an airplane, uh, uh, assassinating a UN official, those whole, the sectoral convention, the terrorist bombing convention after Cobar Towers, the terrorist bombing convention, the terrorist financing convention. In other words, my argument is we don't need a comprehensive definition of terrorism. It wouldn't do us a bit of good except to divide things and make things even more complicated. If you bomb something and you fall within the convention, we prosecute you for it. Not a problem. Another question. Um, I wanted to ask about the location itself of Guantanamo Bay and what went into the decision making of mm -hmm. to decide whether it was U.S. soil, whether it's Cuban soil. Does the Constitution apply? All these questions yeah. that are raised by the actual location of the prison. Yeah. Um, well, you needed some place overseas because there was a long line of human rights law and human rights jurisprudence that said, for example, habeas. The second you bring them back onto U.S. soil, there is, in fact, a constitutional right to habeas. And the argument is to say, well, they're detained in a, we've never, ever, ever in, our, in world history given habeas rights to unlawful participants in conflict. And in fact, prior to Guantanamo, nobody had ever done that. So, so they wanted to keep it outside the United States to keep it simple, to keep it clean. And then you start looking at places outside the United States, and Guantanamo is easy. You can fly there in DC in the morning. Right? So it's logistically easy. Um, the US Constitution does, in fact, apply, because we have exclusive jurisdiction. Um, our rights to Guantanamo come from uh, a treaty from the, from the Spanish-American War era, which gives us rights in perpetuity for a dollar a year. Castro doesn't, doesn't cash our check. We send him a check every year for a dollar. Um, we have rights in perpetuity so long as, here's the language of the treaty, we use it as a naval coaling station. And some people have argued, well, you don't use it as a naval coaling station, but they re it's a purposive, interp a functional interpretation. It's a naval base. Of course we use it as a naval coaling station within the meaning of the, um, the, the lease. Um, so as a matter of constitutional law, 
That's the issue. U.S. law applies there exclusively, but the exact ways that the Constitution applies to non-American citizens is very debatable. And there's a long line of cases, for example, from occupied Germany, where we had the same questions, occupied Japan, we had the same questions. This is not a novel Guantanamo issue. Uh, although what the Supreme Court did with some of those cases is very interesting no, wait, wait. in legal terms. Another question. Yes. The um, United States has had enemies that were, I guess, could be defined as not as combatants that have done damage to us and attacked us for hundreds of years. Why suddenly in 2001 did we have a need for a Guantanamo when we never had one before? Um, Well, because I think the world has changed, right? To, if, if, if you presume in a world where there is no detention facility, you really only have two other alternatives. Either A, as the Deputy Secretary of State said, you kill them all, irrespective of where they are in the world, and that violates Article 2.4 of the UN Charter. Um, or B, you resuscitate the, the law of reprisals. You say, so Al-Qaeda bombed us, and Al-Qaeda facilitated this attack, and therefore we're going to have reprisals um, that law in the mid-70s controversially began to be outmoded. So really the only option you've got is to capture them. Um, and then you have the question of where you're going to prosecute them, where you're going to try them, which is why you need some place like Guantanamo. Um, that, and that's, it, it's a pragmatic problem. If we didn't have Guantanamo, uh, we'd still have people that we needed to capture and wanted to capture. Um, and, and the other thing is that human rights law now fully applies human rights principles as a non-derogable principle of human rights. You simply cannot kill people. It's a non-derogable fundamental principle of human rights law unless you do so in accordance with the laws and customs of war. So it's the perfect, it's the perfect storm of these bodies of law that bump up against each other. Okay, we got, we got room for two more questions, I'm afraid. This gentleman off, here. Off the, side, and then off the subject slightly, here. would you comment on the assassination of Osama bin Laden? That's not an assassination, it's a targeted killing. Um, you go through that whole framework um, of, of a civilian taking direct part in hostilities, and I've been asked that question a lot, and it's a very simple, and this gets back to the question of why have Guantanamo in the first place. There's lots and lots and lots of human rights lawyers out there, and lots of organizations who would argue, even for somebody like bin Laden, that we had the legal obligation to capture them alive that you may only kill them, that anything short of capturing them alive is unlawful per se, it's a war crime, unless it was absolutely necessity, uh, absolute necessity, and, and only required by the exigencies of the circumstances. Um, that is a human rights-based policing sort of a model. And that's exactly right when human rights law applies. Osama and others like him, though, are not in the normal peacetime human rights mold. Um, Think of it as a burden shifting. If, if the police want to kill a bank robber, the burden is on the police to justify that use of force. Based on specific, narrow circumstances, it's immediate, it's urgent, it's required for self-defense, et cetera. In the law of armed conflict model, which is what you're in with Osama in that K or in that house, the burden is ex exactly flipped. You're in an armed conflict model. You are a lawful target who may be targeted and killed. Where's the burden? The burden is on you because you're a civilian taking direct part in hostilities, the burden is on you to indicate, I don't want to take part in hostilities anymore. I want to be protected. And the second you do that, going back to the question about why Guantanamo, you have to be taken alive. And, and, and that would have been an unlawful murder. If Osama had indicated in any way that he wanted to leave hostilities and then they gunned him down in any way, that's cold-blooded murder. Okay, we have one last question. Where is the rule against about spies come in on this. Is it I'm not, sorry? The punishment for spies is pretty clear. Why, why aren't most of these people spies? Um, well, the, 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 the misconception is, um, the legal phrase is, is that there's a unitary body of international law. And what that means in philosophical terms is that everybody everywhere has international law that applies to them, that operates, bump up against domestic laws. I don't subscribe to that view. There's lots of places where international law simply doesn't apply and shouldn't apply. Spying and all the intelligence-related activities is a huge category of activity where the world has said that's a void, that's a gray, that's a, not even a gray area. That's an area where international law doesn't allow it, 
but doesn't prohibit it either. Um, and it's the same with unlawful combatancy. There is no affirmative right for a citizen simply to take up arms against another government. There is nothing in international law that says you can do that. There are no affirmative protections for that. And that's one of those big voids in international law. But then the next step is, what rights do they get? Even a spy, if you captured a spy and tortured them, you'd be in violation of your fundamental obligations not to torture. But it comes from a different set of legal norms. I'm afraid we're going to have to draw this to a close and uh, thank today's speaker for uh, an enlightening presentation.